Hi there, Graham from Penguin Motors again, sitting in my favourite seat in the house. The only reason being is that it's in my favourite place in a diner cell. Bingo. That's a big difference. Today we're going to run a test on a 4.6 litre V8 Rover engine. It is in fact the same uh, three and a half litre engine we did for Hughes V8 Rover. We took the opportunity to do an upgrade, so we've now stretched it. It's no longer a 3.5, it's now a 4.6. It uses the same heads, cam, intake, exhaust manifold in, air force assembly. Everything is the same except it's now bigger. And the upshot of that is we, are, we would expect a massive increase in low speed torque. Top end horsepower is very little different. And that is really because the induction system is absolutely strangling the engine for airflow. The standard air filtration and intake assembly just cannot support the airflow needs for the big motor. So what you end up with is a motor that produces a huge wall of torque low down, but doesn't really make any horsepower at the top end. We did test it earlier. It was getting on for 100 pound foot torque up at 2100 RPM. From memory, it was only making 10, 15 more horsepower at the top. This morning when we ran that test, the intake air temp in the dyno cell was, it's a hot day, it was 49, like 50, 49 to 50 degrees C, which is huge. The dyno itself does compensate. When it gives you a corrected power figure, it's taken atmospheric and temperatures into account. If we show you corrected power figures, it's made an allowance, but I would still expect testing it under cooler conditions to see more, but well, we shall see. We're gonna warm the engine up, do a couple of pulls, see what we get. That's the difference. Running the slightly cool air, we pulled out 192 horsepower and an incredible 290 pound foot of torque. I'll just put this into a graph so you can better see. And just for laughs and giggles, we'll put the engine in its 3.5 form on top. Bingo. That's a big difference. There we have it. One graph, two power curves. 3.5 in red, 4.6 in black. As we can see, at the top end, the power difference isn't massive. It's about 19 horsepower. But in the real world, where we drive 98% of the time, look at it, it's huge. That is a vast difference. The reason the top end power here, the gap isn't as big, is simply because the engine clearly, you look at that, it gets to about 3000 RPM, and then it's been severely starved of air. And as such, the torque curve drops away hugely. If we'd have put more cam in it, it would have carried on a bit, and therefore took the power curve up a bit. Likewise, if we'd have given it more induction, same thing, it would have held on to the torque a bit longer and made more power at the top end. Would it have made more, more down here? Not a lot, I don't think. Maybe a little more. I mean, the staggering thing is, although this graph doesn't show it, if you extend on the power curve, you can see that the thing's making about 200 pound foot at idle. It really has got a lot of get up and go. And certainly if you're talking in terms of torque capacity and grunt, the Americans are absolutely right in what they say. There ain't no substitute for cubic inches. What can I say but wow? Well, it was expected that taking a 3.5 and turning it into a 4.6 would give a bunch of torque. And we didn't expect any real top end power improvement. The top end power did go up. It, it went up 15 horsepower, so it went up from 173 to 188. The torque increase was absolutely phenomenal. Torque is where you're going to drive in the real world. 98% of driving isn't full throttle. It's not round at the red line. It's third, fourth gear. 30, 40 mile an hour, want a bit of overtaking. All you want to do is squeeze the throttle, have the engine pick up and go without changing down gear and working a gearbox, which is fun, but not really what you want to do in your everyday road car. And not really what you want to do if you want to make some brisk progress and maybe your wife or partner in the car, you'd rather they didn't notice. Because if you just ease your foot down and the car just picks up and goes. It doesn't tend to get noticed by anyone other than a driver. But I know from personal experience that uh, 
you start working the gear stick and revving the engine, your the question soon comes, hey, what's the hurry? Whereas if uh, you've got a nice talky motor and you just ease it on and then the car just wafts away, you don't tend to get a comment. But anyway, in the real world, this way you really drive, this engine will produce prodigious amounts of torque. I mean, 288 pound foot. It's only about six pound foot down on what this 4.6 would do in a Range Rover with its vastly superior fuel injection and uh, modern engine management uh, systems. And let's face it, we've got the same engine, but the exhaust system that we're running through is, is nothing like as efficient. The induction is woefully restrictive. But to be honest, you don't need any more. The P6 wasn't wasn't exactly slow in the first place. It's got some muscle. It'll hold its own. I can't wait to drive this just to, just to see. It's so immense. I think we've got more torque than the chassis can cope with. But that said, you don't have to use full throttle. The owner liked this as a 3.5. He was uh, chuffed with the responsiveness and the get up and go with it. This is going to be good. And it's just a shame we can't run this with um, you know, a four barrel or a decent intake because then I think we'd see even more torque and some um, pretty serious horsepower numbers. But say, it's not going to street racers car, so we don't need a high RPM rocket ship engine. What I thought I'd do is I'd give you a very brief walk around engine on the dyno. This here being the 4.6. To look at the engine itself, there's almost no difference to that in the 3.5. Certainly not externally when it's dressed up to fit in a P6. One is there's a hole in the block where the 4.6 would have had a crank sensor. And two, this block is cross bolted, which are bolts that tie into the main bearing caps to support them from the side, as well as the original bolts that go up from the bottom. It's a bit cramped and untidy in here, but I'll also give you a quick shot of the exhaust system. In a lot of dyno cells, a lot of them, engines are tested with just headers or open exhausts. I don't do that. A, it's very noisy, and I like to be kind to our neighbours and indeed um, my wife in the office. Unfortunately, we don't have the length or the ability to install the full factory exhaust system, so I do the next best thing. Here we have one engine. If we take you around the other side, down the bottom of the block, and then we see the cross bolts. There's another one there, and there's another one right up there. And there's a hole in the block where the factory 4.6 crank sensor should be. Standard 3.5 S exhaust manifold, length of downpipe with wide band over two sensor, and that then goes into a flexible section. We have another downpipe into flexi, into an S downpipe, which curls, goes around here, curls around, winds its way around here, up, up the exhaust extractor. So it pretty sick closely simulates, pretty closely simulates the factory exhaust. Other than that, there's nothing, nothing particularly unusual, special. So guys, what did you think of our test? Would you want a 3.5 or would you want a 4.6? Maybe you wanted a three and a half with more intake and more cam and more revs. But then if we'd have done that to the 4.6, we'd have still got more revs, more power. Which would you like to have? Is the 4.6 too much for the chassis? Mm -hmm. Depends how hard you use your right foot really. But it's been fascinating finding out. And if you'd like to see more videos on these engines, Fiat Rovers or Ford or whatever else. If you like engines, you like see what you saw, click, share, subscribe, ring the bell and we'll bring you some more. Catch you next time.